not really. Not really. Okay. Excellent. Probably it's because, I mean, in a, I mean, the room is probably, you know, small, so that's why you get some echo. I'll try to speak like this. Is it any better? No, no, perfect. And, okay. And you don't hear an echo from me, right? Oh, yeah, sure. So let, maybe let's start, you, Luca, because I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, thank you for joining us, Luca. We have you know, a number of people who join our CAT conference today. Um, and today, for those of you joining, um, Luca Testa uh, works in Milano. Uh, he's a professor of cardiology and an interventional cardiologist with a lot of experience in coronary and structural heart intervention. And one of Luca's area of interest where we've published on together, but he's very well published, is durability of transcatheter aortic prostheses. Uh, and so we've been talking a lot about TAVA and so on, and a question that keeps coming up even last week has been durability. So I think your talk is really perfect uh, and the timing is perfect, Luca. So yeah, thanks for well, joining us. We really appreciate it. Oh, well, Azim, it's, um, you know, that's a pleasure for me to, to join you in this, in this beautiful initiative, by the way. And uh, I mean, I think the timing is really important because I want to just mention that, you know, I, I'm going to present some additional data in the upcoming TCP this week. So, I mean, this is really hot topic. And um, you know that my interest started years ago, well, together with yours, and, uh, but it is still there. I mean, there are a lot of unanswered questions and uh, I'm, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not here to give answers, but at least to provide some more evidence, some, some data to discuss about. But anyway, so uh, hello everybody, for those who are listening to us and watching us. Anyway, so the, the subject I mean, has been introduced nicely by my friend, Asim Latif, and as you can read, is long-term durability transcatheter of bioprosthesis. So let me just introduce the frame within we are going to discuss. You all know that when we talk about bioprosthesis, we need to distinguish between surgical and transcatheter. Of course, the majority of us, we are interventional cardiologists, so it's not our job to discuss about surgical prosthesis. However, we need to know this field of the cardiovascular arena because, of course, in the future, we will see a lot of this degenerated, degenerated bioprosthesis. Anyway, a simple classification is based on the, some, some features of the valves, particularly for surgical. And, uh, well, I'm not going to through all the details, but just let me mention that there are stentless, stentless, or sutureless surgical bioprosthesis. For a transcatheter, the, the situation is actually small, very similar. Indeed, we got balloon expandable, self-expanding mechanical expansion, just mentioning the, the Lotus one, by the way. So this, this data comes from US, as you perfectly know, but even better than me. So in 2006, more than 65,000 patients have been treated for aortic problems, aortic stenosis mainly. And as you can see, depending on age, there is a prevalence of several mechanical bioprosthesis, particularly in, let's say, younger patients. While for patients relatively older, there was a prevalence of several tissue, so biological valves, and that these data are related to 2006. In 2010, I mean, things are slightly changed, as you can see, because the philosophy was already changing, in particular, our colleagues, the surgeons, they were more inclined to use tissue valves rather than mechanical valves, even in a younger population. So there was actually a, a switch in considering that 85% of patients have been treated with a bioprosthesis. In, in 2016, the scenario has changed. We're still talking about the Medicare data in the US. As you can see here, there is a 30% patients treated with harbor. So we can discuss, but it's not the focus of this discussion. We, we can discuss that power is actually, I mean, the way to answer an unmet clinical need and was actually the truth a few days, a few years ago. Indeed, the majority of patients older than 75 years old were treated with power. And there was a, a still a, a high prevalence of patients treated with biological bioprosthesis, even by the surgeons. And this is to further, let's say, highlight this data. I mean, but in particular, from 2012 to 2015, this data has been published on JAMA 2018, you can see that particularly for patients in the elderly phase of their life, and let's say older than 76, there was a steep increase in the use of TABR. I would say that things didn't really change 
much for those who are younger, particularly for patients in their 50s or 60s. But as you can see, there was already some kind of signal. These data, again, are referred to 2015. And that's the reason why the valve durability has therefore emerged as a fundamental issue in a kind of era of aortic valve replacement. This is not just, uh, let's say, an anticipation, some kind of assumption based on an analyst model. So, and apparently, I mean, there is, you know, for some kind of forecast, we can say, about 2025, that this is, is the growth that is expected, in particular in terms of, let's say, um, you know, based on revenue split assumption. But this is just a way to show that this field is really, really moving fast. This slide is actually just a way to introduce one of the main problems. So, as you can see in the left side of this panel, there is, you know, a lack of expectancy of the patient and then at the age at valve implantation. So, if we compare the life expectancy ratio, it should be one for men, meaning that at 62, a man should have a valve that is able to, to be durable for 20 years. This is the life expectancy to have a ratio one for 69, 15 years and so forth, meaning that we need to expect, we would like to expect that at 62 for our younger patients, the durability of, this, of the valve should be much longer. But let's say and see one of the possible mechanisms being you know, introduced to explain this kind of process. I want to show this slide, even if it refers to more than 20 years ago, because the situation you will see that it has not changed that much. This model actually relates to Isolated, isolated tissue processes of mineralization, the pathway one, and a non-calcific degradation, the pathway two, to gross clinical failures. Such failures have a calcification with caspal stiffening, caspal defects without calcific deposits, or caspal tears associated with mineralization. The calcification and non-calcific de deterioration may occur independently of one another, or they may be synergistic. We will see later on what's the meaning of this. Implant, as well as all structures, may interact to induce the collagen oriented calcific deposit, noted ultra structurally. And these deposits predominate at flexion points, such as the commissures. So the pathway one was actually believed to be responsible for the degeneration at the side of the commissures, while the stress causes disruption of collagen fibers, which may eventuate in gross caspal defect. So apparently, according to this theory, again, more than 10 years ago, th there are these two pathways X at the same time in the same patient, and there are, let's say, few different pathways leading to what we see in a clinical field. But although dynamic mechanical TV is not a prerequisite of calcification, the stress may enhance calcification, so it is a vicious circle, as you can see. This is a the classification that has been introduced in Europe a few years ago. And I'm sorry to say that, that sometimes in our job we need to talk about classification. And you will see, this is probably the Achilles heel of this subject. Anyway, the structure of valve deterioration has been defined as an intrinsic permanent changes of the prosthetic valve, i.e. calcification, lipid thrombosis, tear or flare, leading to degeneration or dysfunction. The non-structural valve deterioration has been actually classified, classified as any abnormality, not intrinsic to the prosthetic valve itself, intra or paraprosthetic regurgitation, prosthesis malposition, patient prosthesis mismatch, and late embolization. So just starting from these two completely different classification, you can understand what is, what's the effort to try to classify, let's say, a subject that is really, really complex in terms of pathophysiology, but also in terms of presentation. Thrombosis and endocarditis, I would say, are much easier to classify and understand. So I'll go through this quickly. This mechanism that I'm showing here has been actually taken from the process and the theory that I showed a few minutes ago. But you will see that in details, and it's actually exactly the same thing. So according to this classification of, well, I said, adopted in Europe, the structure deterioration it is actually based on leaflet classification, leaflet tear, bulk seam disruption, and stem fracture. 
It's actually working together with non-structured deterioration that is actually characterized by lethal thrombosis, endocarditis, special prosthesis mismatch, and parabola leakage. These two mechanisms together may lead to inflammation, and this inflammation is actually the final stage of, what, of the increased lethal stress abnormal flow pattern. And again, these two processes I just said are both related to passion-related factors as well as to prosthesis-related factors. Again, in 20 years, apparently nothing has significantly changed. So we are still there trying to understand what's the real mechanism behind. What I can say, and it's for sure, that these patient-related factors are always the same. This lipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, the metabolic syndrome, but also the prosthesis-related factors are always the same. The absence of anti-mineralization treatment flows in the bioprosthesis design, of course, but also the severe prosthesis patient mismatch and the small prosthesis size. They are always the same in the last 20 years. Again, let me explain that the meaning of staging this kind of process has been actually you know, stemming from the need to discuss and trying to understand and classify the structure of valve deterioration, but also the non-structure valve dysfunction, they definitely lead to hemodynamic valve deterioration. And in that case, starting with the pharmacotherapy, we are not here to discuss the pharmacotherapy, but the pharmacotherapy can actually have two possible outcomes, restoration of a normal bioprosthetic valve or actually a bioprosthetic valve failure. The bioprosthetic valve failure is actually a clinical concept because it is related to events, clinical, major clinical events related or possibly related to a bioprosthetic dysfunction. Indeed, in Europe, we define this BDF as autopsy findings likely related to the cause of death, but related to repeat intervention. The concept of repeat intervention, you see, is coming really strongly since we are talking about this, this concept, in particular because the repeat intervention was the main factor in particular for the surgical experience. This is a classification that has been proposed by Beer a couple of years ago. But you know, rather than a single classification, what I'm honestly trying to explain is the fact that we have a lot of classification. And the situation, honestly, is not clear because of this classification. It is, it is possibly even more confused, as I will show in a second. Starting from 1996, the surgical experience tried to define what is a valve failure. And as you can see here, in 1996, the, the first definition was any change in function of an operated valve resulting from intrinsic abnormality of the valve that causes stenosis or regurgitation. So it is obvious nowadays in 2020, it is obvious that this definition is absolutely far away from any possible practical implementation. And I have to say, in the paper that we published early this year, probably I contributed to this confusing situation because the initial classification, classification proposed by the European Society of Cardiology, in my mind, and I published on European Journal, by the way, we all agreed that there was some kind of flaws. It was really harder to apply to a practical approach. Indeed, all this classification, of course, are not there because I want to read it, but just to show you what's the What's the confusing situation we are living in nowadays? Anyway, let's try to define this. Historically defined as reoperation for SVD. So starting from the surgical experience, we all started there. So the, the first definition was a person, a patient that needs to be reoperated. From 2006, more than 20 definitions of SVD using echocardiographic criteria. So let me show this just to, again, highlight some, uh, some of the issues here. This is just surgical experience, and this is durability defined by the concept of reintervention. It is obviously a relatively useless concept in terms of practice because, of course, a patient that needs to be reoperated, of course, can have a very heterogeneous story as compared to another patient. Anyway, it's just to show you that in terms of percentages up to 10 years, 40%, even 20 years, 40%. So it's a large, large number. Of course, we are talking about bioprosthesis. 
But if you look at this, the same subject by means of the echo, echocardiography, we see that there is not a lot of difference. Indeed, if you, if you look bottom right, you see that the number is, is actually around 40% again. So that's the place where we started from the surgical experience. But let's talk about this. I mean, something that is more recent, a 10 year follow up in this nice paper published on Jack 2018, you see that up to 10 years, in 672 consecutive patients undergoing sorrow with a bioprosthesis, 2002, 2004, so a lot of years ago, many years ago, a clinical relevant SVD actually occurred, occurred really, really rarely. We are talking about 4%. And this number is just, rel well, relatively higher than compared to reoperation, in particular because if you compare this two, there is a discrepancy. Indeed, when I actually was preparing the slide, I said, hmm, there are more people reoperated than patients with a clinically relevant SVD. If you look at this, you may wonder what happened. Nevertheless, that's exactly the, the, the situation because the definitions were suboptimal, at least. These are the vivid registry. So as you can see, the time to failure of the majority of the cases, the majority of the patients enrolled in this registry, and we are talking about 15, 19 patients. The majority of these bulbs tended to degenerate to in the, at the set after seven to 11 years. And that's something that of course is more like up to date. Having said that, should we concern, be concerned about THB durability? Well, there are some reasons to be, some reasons not to be. Yes, because study leaflets are thinner compared to surgical bulbs. Tabby leaflets are subject to higher stresses and strains because of the crimping. And the tabby has more paravalvular leakage, that's for sure. Tabby duration is shorter in tissue fatigue models. So we can open a huge, huge, huge question about that. But that's what we know from the mechanical engineering models. No, because tabby has less patient prosthesis mismatch. This is absolutely true. We know from our experience that a lot of patients, in particular those who have the generation in terms of stenosis, the patient prosthesis mismatch is a big of a problem. Tabby is a larger orthobulb area, so that's sure, and tabby valves may be improving across generation. And this is also true. So let's talk about what we know from the tabber experience. This table is just to show you that there is a nice, let's say, relatively homogeneous distribution of self-expanding and balloon expandable valves and with a follow-up ranging from five years to eight years. So these are, let's say, the sources of what we know nowadays. And in terms of, let's say, numbers, a structural bulb deterioration at five to eight years with a weighted incidence can be considered around 1.3% when it comes to the interval 0.7 to 1.9, which is really, really reassuring, I have to say. But there are some questions about these numbers and their reliability, but we'll talk about that later on. If you look at the bioprosthetic valve failure on the right side of the slide, you see that up to six to eight years, a weighted incident, the number is around 3.7%, with a window with a confidence interval 2.7, 4.6. So again, numbers are pretty low, so pretty reassuring. But the question is, what is the quality of these numbers? Anyway, that's Full for thoughts for discussion later on. Let's see what the main, let's say, main sources of evidence. The CHOICE trial. This is the publication this year. And uh, just to remember, the CHOICE trial is an investigator initiated trial that randomized 20 to 141 high risk patients with severe artery stenosis designed to compare device performance of balloon expandable versus self expanding. And these are the numbers. So, as you can see, in terms of structural valve deterioration, it seems that self-expanded valves have an advantage compared to balloon expandable. And this is apparently true for moderate structural valve deterioration. It's not that true for severe. Apparently, there is an advantage for balloon expandable in terms of moderate to severe paravalvular leak, even if it's just a trend. And also in terms of valve thrombosis, apparently it's just a trend if you look at the P. The self-expanding valves appear to be, let's say, safer, but of course, don't take this 
as gold because probably these numbers are not reliable. What about the notion trial? The notion trial is an old camera patient with severe optic stenosis, lower surgical risk for mortality, where randomized one to one patient to tower or sabre. As you can see on the left side, at sixth year, the rate of moderate SVD was around 3% for tower and it was 22% for sabre. I mean, there's no need to comment on this. And the definition that's been adopted for the notion trial for moderate SVD is a mean gradient at least 20 millimeters or less than 40 millimeters. The change in mean gradient is higher than 10, but less than 20. If you look at the right side of the slide, you see that for six years, severe, severe structural bubble deterioration is almost the same. So in other words, what we've seen today, that in terms of moderate SVD, it's much easier to find differences, even, of course, even because the events are much more common as compared to severe SVD. What about the CORBAB US at risk? You probably remember very well this trial. I mean, if you look at, and this is a total, a total of 797 patients who were randomized, 45 US centers, of whom 750 underwent an attempt in plan. So at the end, the population was covered around 400 and suburb 350. So five year moderate SVD, as you can see, there is a 5% for tavern and a 26% for suburb. And again, the same, same definition that has been used in the notion. Again, for severe SVD at five years, there was no difference, but again, this is probably related to the fact that the event of severe SVD is much less common. What about the pattern? 699 patients were enrolled in part in one called HAR A. No structural bar deterioration, while its surgical bar replacement were recorded in other group, has been published five years ago on Lancer. So apparently, there is no there was no difference in terms of mean gradient, as you can see on the left side of the slide, but also in terms of bulb area, no significant difference between tavern. Sever according to echocardiographic parameters. But what matters from this trial? And there's no structure about the derivation. What about the partner two? Okay, partner two called A, hey, 2000 something intermediate risk patients with severe symptomatic orthostenosis. stenosis. So the two groups were very homogeneous, as you can see here in Tabor Sever. At five years, more patients in the Tabor group than in the surgery group had at least mild parabolic orthostenosis regurgitation. Repeat of hospitalizations were more frequent after terror than after surgery, as were aortic boundary interventions. So in other words, in this trial, intermediate risk, we could see, we could appreciate some differences in terms of durability as compared for comparing terror versus terror and talking about intermediate risk patients. No, apparently no changes in terms of mortality. These are our data. As in, these are our data, data from the Italian clinical service project. This has been published early this year. 990 patients treated with core valve from June 2007 to December 2011 in Italian centers. The longest follow up obviously reached 11 years, but were very few people. I want to show this slide, not because it's just, you know, the largest cohort nowadays available, but it's because I want to show you in particular the problem of the cumulative incidence of deaths. That's one of the main problems, the main issue when talking about the durability of the travel, because these patients are at high risk, they are very old, and the risk of mortality is a, a concern in terms of evaluating all these numbers, all these percentages that have been given in the, in the last few minutes. I used, we used, an adaptive definition because we define a moderate SVD as mean gradient at least 20 millimeters mercury, but less than 40 millimeters mercury, and at least 10 millimeters, but less than 20 millimeters increase from post procedure. So, in other words, I changed the definition given by the European Society of Cardiology because what matters is not just the baseline gradient, but also the change in terms of gradient, because only on either of these two, let's say, signal are not sufficient to really detect all the patients with a structural bar deterioration. 
So in other words, going back to the mortality issue, you will see that eight years we observed a mortality that was higher than 78%. However, we could do this analysis because we use that as a comp company risk analysis. Numbers, eight year durability, considering that as a company risk that can prevent SVD to happen, actually gave us 3% of moderate SVD, 1.6% of severe SVD, and 2.5% risk of biopostatic valve failure. Looking at the echocardiography parameters, they are very assuring because at eight, eight years, the mean aortic gradient and rates of trivial mild parabarbara leak did not significantly change over time. Of course, there was a significant decrease of the gradients before and after the procedure, but that's obvious. However, it was really reassuring to see that at eight years, the rate of degeneration leading to a significant increase in the gradient, but also a significant increase in the aortic regurgitation parabarbara leak was not, apparently was not there. The cumulative incidence function of bioprostatic late biprosthesis valve failure, according to the company risk analysis, actually is shown here. It was basically 2.5%, with a confidence interval going from 1.2 to 5%. So in other words, using that as a competing risk that can prevent the SVD or the DDF to occur, we found that this risk at eight years can be estimated safely in terms of methodology, estimated in 2.5%. So it's very reassuring, I have to say. So I'm going actually towards the end of this. Issues regarding tower durability. So the CMR market FD approval occurred in 2007 and 2011, respectively, representing a relatively young technology that precludes valve durability analysis beyond 10 years. And of course, before comparing our results beyond 10 years with results coming from the surgical experience, we need more time. The current data on long-term outcomes refers to the first generation transcatheter valves, meaning that the prosthesis that we are using now are different, some, sometimes completely different to compared to the first generation. However, we can conclude that the first generation was relatively safe as con well considering the data that are actually had the chance to publish. The tower population currently consists of early patients with multiple comorbidities and high risk profiles. So the high mortality rate. So in other words, we always need to consider death as a competing risk. Otherwise, we can miss reality. So these are my conclusions and I hope some take home messages. One of the greatest difficulties in comparing valve durability among series on surgical or catheter based valve replacement stems from differences in adopted definition. We need to find a definition that can be applied to the surgical experience, to the transcatheter experience, and we need to use that definition instead of changing definitions every, every year, I have to say. Indeed, I personally can tell my story and it was so difficult to adapt to use the definition coming from the European Society of Cardiology because if you apply that definition per se, it doesn't really match with the reality. According to the latest published research on tower durability up to eight years, no safety concerns emerge in comparison to historical several data and low rates as VD and DVF has been reported. Potential differences in durability between PHVs should be further investigated because of course, what I can personally assume about the core valve first generation, I have no chance to translate that on balloon expanding or other procedures. I simply don't know. Robust durability data for Tavera are expected in the next few years, and this is what we need. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Luca. It was really... Um... A thorough presentation of the data um, and uh, you know thank you for I think it's hard to summarize all of this in a short period um, I think it, I guess there are a couple of interesting points I'm gonna let Zach join us as well Zach is one of our fellows uh, so Zach if you can turn on your microphone and camera too and he will ask some questions as well if you don't mind um, oh, please. yeah you know I mean 
a lot of it, you know, this whole thing about definitions, I think is important and needs to be highlighted again, you know, because often I still, when I hear my surgical colleagues talk to our patients about how long a biological valve lasts, I still hear 12 to 16 years or 12 to 15 years. Um, and I struggle sometimes to find where their data is based on, right? And often the definition for that is like you showed in your first few slides, is based on freedom from reintervention. Uh, so you could actually have a valve with structural valve degeneration, be symptomatic from it, but maybe you're not a surgical candidate, okay? Because you have comorbidities. You wouldn't be counted. You'd, your valve wouldn't be counted in a, a less durable valve based on the previous definitions. I mean, do you think that the, our surgical or the surgical, our surgical colleagues or the surgical world are gonna accept these definitions that we're giving of you know, moderate, severe structural valve degeneration? Well, um, this is a relatively complex question because I mean, one of the main problem of the surgical patients is actually the follow-up because at least in my experience, a lot of surgical colleagues, they basically look after the operation and then the follow-up is left to the cardiological world. So in other words, I mean, I think they should accept the definition that we are giving. And actually these definitions we are trying to find are basically based on clinical, clinical point of view, clinical events, but also on echocardiogram signals. So in other words, we should sit around, sit around the table and say, look, we need to have an homogeneous definition because they always say, I mean, a surgical colleague, they always say, they always say look, this valve is, will be there for at least 10 years. Based on what? Based on what they found years and years and years ago. But they are using different prosthesis as we do, exactly the same thing. So in other words, we must convince our colleagues that we need to have an homogeneous definition. Don't ask me what, what we are you know, thinking about because honestly, I think that the definition that we applied for the paper on European journal is relatively good because it says a lot in terms of practical application, it can be implemented. However, I'm not saying that's the best one. We're still, I'm still wondering what's the best definition, in particular because, for example, I'm giving you an example. Let's say that you are implanting a very small tavern, very small. So you can anticipate, in particular, if it's a balloon expanding, you know that this valve may be associated with some gradient. So what's the destiny of that? What is the passion for thesis in match? And you know how much it, it is involved in the determination. So in other words, we need to have an homogeneous definition starting from, let's say, larger amount of data. What has been proposed so far, in my mind, in my opinion, is not sufficient, not sufficient. But definitely, surgeons must update their own definitions. Otherwise, we speak different languages. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm going to let Zach ask a couple of questions, and then I have a few more questions too. Uh, Zach? Thank you, doc <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Tessa, for the comprehensive review uh, with great insights. Um, interesting, interesting conversation. I think in the, in the elderly patients, uh, the question is less... Uh, um, less complex. Uh, the, the real question with the valve durability is, uh, uh, is with young patients, uh, 60 years old, we're getting uh, more and more uh, low risk patients uh, having, uh, having TAVR. You think the, the comparison of valve durability should be in these young patients uh, uh, to the surgical uh, bioprosthesis or the mechanical bioprosthesis in the age of valve to va valve, valve in valve, uh, this also should be a factor. Uh, what, what do you think the, the real comparison uh, of valve durability uh, should be? What, what is the reference? Okay, so oh, that, that's a very nice question, by the way. Thank you for that. So um, 
I totally agree with you. I mean, the issue of vulnerability, I mean, of course, we apply this issue, we discuss this issue for all patients. However, uh, for a patient in, in his 80s, in his 90s, it's a, you know, it's not a not, not big deal. However, we are moving towards younger and lower risk population, and it's going to happen. I mean, I can say that at least in Italy, I'm working in the highest volume center in Italy, and I, I must say, that still the mean age of our tower patients is around 81, still. So it didn't change much, I must say. And I'm, I'm sorry, by the way, for that. Anyway, you are right when you say that the issue of durability is a matter of concern for younger people, for younger patients. I totally agree. However, the complexity of this situation is obvious because I don't have patients in their 50s. I don't see those patients. That's the point. So we need to work at best with what we have. So we need to evaluate carefully the data that we have. The, we need to follow up our patients. All the trials, I believe, all the trials that have been published with a shorter follow-up, they should follow the patients as much as possible. I'm talking about the partner, I'm talking about the partner experience, I'm talking about the core value as, I'm talking about all the scope, all the trials done by the companies, they should, in my mind at least, they should follow the patient as long as possible. That's the only way in 2020 to have clear idea about durability. I'm, I don't know about, I cannot speak about your center, as in you may, you may comment on that, but I don't see younger patients. I don't. So uh, this is an answer, unanswered question. I mean, it's still something I cannot answer about it, but I totally agree with you. I mean, a patient in his 90s, I mean, I don't really mind if the, if the prosthesis is about to last only seven or eight years. I mean, not a big deal. Azim, what's the situation there? What's the mean age of your patient? Yeah, I must admit, you know, it's changed a lot in the last year. Uh, since the low risk study and low risk approval uh, that we now reimbursed, probably a third of our patients right now are low risk. Uh, a third? Which means, yeah, yeah. Which wow, means their the STS is, you know, below 3%. Um, we're not doing patients who are 50 years old, okay? We're still doing patients who are in their 70s. Uh, but it's amazing, you know, today, if by definition, I have a 91 year old that I'm about to do a Tava on today, whose STS is 2%. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, by definition, okay, of the low risk trial, he's actually low risk. <laughs> Yet he's 91 years old. Okay. He looks great. He's got nothing else wrong with him, but aortic stenosis. So, you know, there's something wrong with our definitions as well, but, you know, we do, we are seeing more and more patients in their late 60s, early 70s, who are coming to us requesting TAVA, who don't want to have open heart surgery. You know, the one thing in the US is, I think uh, the industry, you know, has done a good job of trying to advertise to patients directly, which is something that doesn't happen in Italy and Europe, uh, but yeah, it does happen. And so patients are more and more coming and they request their TAVA procedure. And so, you know, the question that we have when we do our heart team meetings often in a 70 year old is what valve to use, all right? Um, what valve is gonna give us uh, the best long-term outcomes and durability. And we, we struggle between the fact of, you know, having a balloon expandable valve and maybe it will be easier to perform TAVA in TAVA and have coronary access versus having a self expandable valve, which, you know, you show is possibly, I'm not saying is, but possibly has, you know, has better durability because it has better hemodynamics. Apparently, you know? these um, are the data. But... Yeah, I mean, well, what do you do? I mean, if you have a 70 year old that comes to you and wants a time, nothing else wrong with them. How, do, how, you know, what is you using to make your decision? So, well, to be, to be honest, what I, well, at the moment, I mean, it happened to me that I did oh, maybe four or five patients in their 70s because there were patients, as you said before, aware about this option and they 
strongly rejected surgery. So they said, look, doctor, I want to have a transcatheter valve. It doesn't happen so often, as you said before, because the, well, advertising is not allowed here. But the thing is, for this kind of patient, my first choice would be a balloon expandable for the reasons that you said. I mean, easy volume valve, easy. Easy reaccess to the coronary arteries, because of course, if this patient will leave 20 years after the taber, the first taber, you have time for a second taber, and you got time for ischemic heart disease. So, just to answer your question pointly, definitely balloon expandable. And, you know, the reasons are very clear to me. I cannot even imagine to, to do a volume involved in a very young patient and looking after the coronary arteries afterwards. I mean, that's, that's, you know, just a nonsense to me. But, um, you know, in this, let's say, this conversation, there are several issues, including financial issues, availability, and so forth. I mean, they, we've got no time to, to discuss about that. But nevertheless, to me, a young patient is a good candidate for balloon expandable valves. Unless Zach? you do the okay. commissural alignment, and you know about that. I mean, the commissural alignment is something that we are try we are developing here. I mean, it's a way to avoid the overlap of the prosthesis posts over the ostia of the coronary arteries. And that's a way, for example, you can apply it to the to the portico, you can apply it to the the cementes, you can apply that. And uh, I mean, it works very well. So you got free access to the coronary arteries. Nevertheless, before this technique is published and is under review, we, I believe that still the real good thing to do is a balloon expander. Okay, okay. Excellent. Is... Zach, I'll let you carry on some questions from the chat as well. So there is a question uh, from the audience. Uh, could you comment on the importance of ERO as a surrogate marker? Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, this is one of the key parameters in terms of, oh, let's say, valve performance, immediate but also long-term. There is a problem. I mean, at least in my experience, but even in my center, I would say, I mean, our echocardiographers, they are not used to calculate the ERO every day on every patient, in particular after TAVR. So I believe this is something that should be integrated in the context of, a, let's say, a thorough evaluation of the patient. But I have to say, I have to say that it's not routine, at least in my center, but I, I can speak for a lot of centers here in Italy. We are all doing the same. Every time I collect cases, but even for the last project, as even you may remember, the transit one I'm going to present, the hero was terrible because no one collected these cases. I don't know what is your approach, what is your practice, but at least in Italy, but in Europe, this is really, really rare that you get a follow-up echo with a calculation of the effective, effective orifice area. What's the approach over there? Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, we, we try and make it standard. You know, part of the issue is because we have the TVT registry that we all participate in and every patient gets an echo every year and on the TVT registry they want to have uh, they want to have all of their data so yeah indeed there is a it's comment become pretty I mean, much standard. yeah there's it's a become comment pretty that. much standard. yeah yeah that's Cynthia Taub so Cynthia is the head of uh, echo in our hospital. Okay. Uh, so she would know. <laughs> because if it's not there, I'm the one who's well. complaining. She okay. Sure, she makes sure that her team is yeah. always providing us with data. So we're actually pretty good with doing that. Um, good. Zach, yeah. there's another question about, which I think is really interesting from Sultan. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so he's commenting uh, that the surgical risk uh, may be an outdated. Uh, Score risk. Uh, he's asked. He's in oh. your scoring system based on. Okay, or... so uh, I can speak the all day about this. Let's. Well, uh, I mean, for the sake of time, I would say that every single score, you know, derived from the surgical experience, 
is at least, let's say, suboptimal in differentiating the patient, at least. For example, the concept, the concept of, let's say, coagulation, the concept of frailty, the concept of, let's say, um, hostile chest, all these things that are crucial for the surgical risk are not there, or at least they are not there as much as they should. So in other words, we are all discussing this since long time, long time really, since the beginning of the Tarver experience. All the, every single score that we try to apply as really very poor classification power in the patients, let's say, evaluated for Tarver. And that's the truth, that's reality. So the thing is that a way to overcome this issue is to discuss honestly during the RP meeting, saying, look, okay, that's the score, but that's the risk. Otherwise, we are still turning around this concept, since, well, since 10 years, more or less. But anyway, in my specific opinion, I would say, okay, I need to calculate the scores because this is even from a legal point of view, I got to do that. I do that. Nevertheless, when I discuss with the surgeon and say, look, this, that, the other are outside the score, but we need to consider. And I have, I have to say that this, let's say, this approach, this philosophy is now adopted by the surgeon as well. So at the end, oh, this is a, a matter of discussion. I mean, sitting around the table with a number. Okay, we got the number. However, the clinical approach, the evaluation of the patient is, let's say, milestone in the evaluation of the tower patient, in particular for, let's say, relatively younger patients, where, you know, it's debatable if you need to go for cyber or fiber. You know, I would take it, you know, even, I, I'm starting to look at it, Sultan, even from a slightly different perspective. So I agree with, um, with Luca that our risk scores are really, um, don't apply uh, to Tava patients. But I think maybe what you're asking is, is kind of what I've been doing now as well. Um, when I get referred a 70-year-old patient or 68-year-old patient where my surgeon says, you know, they, this is a patient they would consider for a biological AVR, I don't look at risk scores. I look at whether that is a good, whether the patient is a good Tava patient or not, mm -hmm. right? So is the anatomy such that I can guarantee the patient an excellent result. So, you know, zero trivial PVL, maybe mild in, in up to maybe 15, 20%, um, no vascular complications, no risk of coronary obstruction. So if I, so I do in those patients, I do the CT first, I do the echo, do the CT. And if on the CT, they look like they're a good TAVI candidate, I don't look at the risk anymore. Because I think the fact that you know, in a 70 year old, um, I think with the data we have, I, you know, to me, that patient should be offered Tavi as their first choice or Tava as their first choice, unless they don't have good anatomy and then surgery should be the second choice. Well, Azim, let me say that obviously I agree with you, but you know, you may remember that in Italy, you need to write on your record, what's the score? You need to do that. You have to do that. Although you don't yeah. believe it, I mean, no one, no one really believes anymore in the scores. But when I talk with the surgeon, that's you know, first sentence. Okay, what's the SDS? Or every time. But again, I, what I usually do is exactly what you do. I see the patient. I look at the possibilities to pro to deliver a perfect result. Okay, you said. Make sure, mm, make sure it's not that, that easy. However, I mean, it's a matter of percentages because there are good candidates and bad candidates. So the evaluation of this, the possibility to discriminate who is going to have very high chance of a good result and, the, and those who are, you know, let's say less, less percentage, percentages to have a very good result. So in other words, it is up to us. We need to evaluate the patients and to suggest what is the best approach for the patient. I think, yeah. I think that the use of, of the scores, I mean, is probably old fashioned. 
It's something we, we should try to eliminate. But again, in Italy, but also in Europe, you know, you must report the number. Otherwise, you are not allowed to do that. Uh, and we, we have to calculate it as well for the, uh, for the TVT registry. But I have to admit, you know, I'm, I'm not using it as much in my decision making anymore. Right. Whereas before it was very important because if I did a low risk patient and I, the STS score was three percent less than three percent, we would not get reimbursed here in the U.S. Right. So the fact now that that's no longer an issue, it's it's more issue of is this will I get a good result? Right. Uh, with a Tava versus, you know, not, you know, and they're regularly patients we see in the clinic, you know, even recently. I saw a really bad, very calcified Tava in a 70 year old who came in saying he wanted Tava, right? Very, very calcified by Casper Valve, sorry. Um, uh, and, you know, convinced him. And we said to him, Listen, you know, you came in for Tava, but you should have surgery. You know, you should have a biological valve. Uh, and then we'll treat your, your, bio, you know, your surgical valve degeneration in 10 years' time. Um, so I think, you know, the individual decision making, maybe that's what Sultan's asking about. Um, is becoming more and more important as I think we allowed and we're treating low and lower risk patients. I agree, Azim. You know that I agree. The thing is that um, Absolutely. there are some restrictions, some, uh, let's say, even local, local ways to deal with patients, referral patterns. I mean, all the things, of course, make it more even more complicated. However, I mean, the the decision process must be based on several several features of the patients and not only on the numbers. I uh, totally agree with you. I mean, and that's the, the message I would like to deliver to our younger colleagues. Okay, numbers for legal purposes, okay, for reimbursement, okay. But at the end of the day, if you are talking with the patient, you are evaluating the patient as a conundrum. Not just a number. Right. Absolutely. And uh, Zach, any final questions before we wrap it up? Uh, I have a question. Actually, uh, there was a recent paper that uh, that uh, showed that renal function improves actually after a tower. Uh, do you think that uh, that risk factors for valve degeneration, like uh, uh, like high cardiac output, renal failure? Uh, or insufficiency, um, parathyroid issues, thyroid issues, uh, LVH also play a factor in, uh, in, in, in the choice uh, of valve, uh, uh, which valve and, and what, uh, what, what approach in, in terms of durability? So I, I would like to split into this, uh, this answer. So it's uh, not just my experience, but is an experience of everyone looking after patients, tabular patients. I mean, as soon as you restore a normal or let's say almost normal flow across the aortic valve, you see there is a, an immediate change in the linear function. So I see, I even see sometimes patients who can become decompensated in the, in the hospital, then, well, you do tabular and then they start having a much better renal function, much better. So the, I'm not talking about the cardio-renal syndrome. I'm just saying that perfusion, perfusion <clears throat> matters. And of course, if the patient has normal renal function, maybe this advantage, this in fact is probably softer. But what I'm saying is we must consider that when we are treating the aortic stenosis, we are improving the perfusion on every single organ of our body, okay? So that's normal. I believe that's normal, okay? In particular, in those kidneys where you got, you know, local ischemia, you got some atherosclerosis. I mean, if you increase, if you improve the perfusion, it will only get better. That's first part of the answer. The second part, well, we got no data. I mean, I cannot be specific to say, look, that's, that patient with that specific condition would be a good candidate for that prosthesis. Honestly, I don't know. But I have to say, 
I'm, I'm not sure that does really matter because the long-term data that we have are only related to the first generation Corval and the first generation Edwards. So we got no choices, by the way. Also, the prostheses we are implanting now are completely different. So having this discussion now, I'm, I'm afraid it makes little sense because the data referred to a previous generation, not this one, okay? That's great. Thanks, Luca. Um, Juan, any, oh, no, so any questions? Nothing, Luca. It was great to see you. It's I'm always a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, apparently, uh, I'll be in contact with New York a lot because I got a rehearsal for Let Bring It Trial in two hours. Okay. Today. <laughs> and then the presentation on Friday, the interview on Friday, and the presentation on Saturday. So, New York is in my mind. Cool. Like the song. What are you presenting? You're going the to present transit. Transit? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. It's um, on the radio so in the circulation. Calvin, Let's cross fingers. Oh, well. Uh, last question. It's just a difficult one. So I'm sorry ah. I give it to you last. Um, um, but maybe if you have a brief answer, I don't, I'm not sure there is an answer. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, discussion about leaflet thickening and subclinical leaflet thrombosis. Do you think that leaflet thickening and subclinical leaflet thrombosis is a separate entity that we're seeing, or it's part of the process of degeneration, of, of valve degeneration? Look, um, let's say, in, I will try to be brief. So empirically, really empirically, when I see something like that, I start the anticoagulation, empirically, because I believe that might be related to the formation of thrombus. And that's what I do, okay? Empirically, I got no data showing that that's the best approach, but I believe that at least it's something that could be related to thrombus formation. Still, very briefly, I think it can evolve in a valve degeneration if it's not thrombus related, okay? So this is a, a, a kind of a gatekeeper to me. If the anticoagulation works, okay, that's thrombus. So it is not really and directly related to, let's say, a degeneration, initial degeneration. But if the anticoagulation doesn't work, that's a degeneration. Okay, I'm trying to be very brief, but we can talk a day about this. So what is your approach? Yeah. I, I I agree. I agree. I, I I do. I am concerned. You know that it could be part of the degeneration. Pro it, could, it may not be the only mechanism, but it could be one of the mechanisms of degeneration. You know, if if you don't know about it, you have lethal thickening. It then becomes organized. Could that then form pennis, right? Uh, with time, I don't know. We know. Um, I think there's a lot more data, but I would not be surprised that that's part of the spectrum or one of the mechanisms of, of valve degeneration. Um, sure. Luca, I can't thank you enough. Uh, thanks so much. Good luck with Transit. I'm hoping, obviously, as a co-author, we get it in. Uh, and um, I appreciate you doing this. Good l and hope to see you soon, my friend. I hope to see you soon, my friends, both of you. I'm very happy to see that you are in good shape. And I know that situation over there is complicated, but uh, stay safe and stay strong. Okay, both of you. Thank you, Luca. Okay, bye. bye.